You can tell a lot about a town by what people choose to keep. Maybe it's a beautiful old Coke sign from many years ago. A faded mural painted on an old brick wall. Or a Carnegie Library that's over 100 years old and still being used today. with modern additions to keep it relevant. And then there's the over 100 year old Mitchell Opera House built in 1906, a place where very big names came to a small town. It was where future President Taft stopped along the campaign trail. It was where Norma Talmadge one of Hollywood's biggest stars of the silent film era, graced the stage. Legendary magician, the great Blackstone, amazed audiences with his magic. He would make rabbits appear from nowhere and then gave them to children in the audience. In his career, he estimated that he'd given away over 80,000 animals. It was where world-famous band leader and songwriter John Philip Sousa performed. In his day, he did over 15,000 concerts and was wildly popular in both America and Europe. A major rock star of his time. It was a place where a small town could see big city Broadway plays. Not to mention vaudeville, live bands, and variety shows bringing the world to Mitchell, Indiana, before television, motion pictures, and even radio. Simply put, there is no substitute for live entertainment. And the Mitchell Opera House was the place to get it. But it's so much more than just a stage and seats, and has a very unusual history you'd never expect from the outside looking in. The Opera House was completed April 17, 1906, and was originally called County Hall. County Halls were community gathering places where you could complain about the trash, elected officials, hear local and national political figures, or even a traveling evangelist. If you needed a big place to meet, you could do it at your County Hall. Plays and recitals were very common. As Monon and b Railroad lines ran through town, it connected Mitchell, Indiana to the big cities of Los Angeles, Chicago, St. Louis, and New York. And with it, the big city came to the small town. One Mitchell, Indiana native saw the railway as an opportunity to bring world-class entertainment to town. His name was Menlo E. Moore. Menlo had not only studied art at the University of Chicago, but was a natural promoter and showman. He convinced big-name entertainment companies to come to Indiana. The premise was this. They could perform in front of a less demanding audience as a practice run for the bigger cities. And amazingly, it actually worked. It would be like having Brad Pitt act or Lady Gaga sing for a crowd of 200 or so people so they could work out the rough edges of their performance. Menlo did this not just for Mitchell, but for other small town theaters, making him incredibly successful. Mitchell's Opera House became a stop on the nationwide B.F. Keith vaudeville circuit. It was a pretty big deal. Menlo Moore had homes of both Mitchell and Vincennes and was on the road constantly to lure talent to his venues and promote the shows. It was during this time that his socialite wife 
named Arna, was pursued by one of Indiana's richest men. That man was Charles Edward Gibson. Charles had made his fortune by finding an oil field, and some say the money went to his head. In his mind, there was nothing he couldn't buy and no woman he couldn't get. Noticing Arna was frequently without her husband, he set out to win her by any means possible. He visited Arna at both her Vincennes and Mitchell homes, seduced her, and then threatened her with blackmail if she didn't keep the affair going. He even sent her telegrams. When Menlo found one of these telegrams, he confronted Arna, and she told him what had happened. Completely enraged, Menlo grabbed a pistol and went to Vincennes in search of Charles Gibson. On October 3rd, Menlo found Charles Gibson at the Union train station platform. When Menlo told him that he knew everything, Gibson just laughed at him and pushed the small framed and five foot six Menlo Moore aside. As Charles Gibson casually walked away, Menlo pulled out his pistol and shot him behind his left ear. When he fell to the ground, Menlo stood over him and shot him four more times and threw down the gun. The bully and womanizer named Charles Gibson was dead. Menlo then jumped on a train that was leaving for Washington, Indiana. While he was apprehended as soon as he got there, amazingly, the well-known Menlo Moore was allowed to first visit his father-in-law, Arnold Paget, who was a prominent attorney and politician. They spoke about the situation, and Menlo's wife, Arna, even joined them for breakfast before he was taken to jail. It was a media sensation, one well-known rich man killing another. However, it was not covered at Mitchell, Indiana, as Menlo Moore's family owned the newspaper. Menlo claimed temporary insanity as his defense. Arna's uncle, Alvin Paget, who was also an attorney, helped build a world-class defense. Five women provided statements that they too had been seduced and blackmailed by Charles Gibson. On December 9, 1910, Menlo Moore was acquitted of all charges. His final defense? There was an unwritten law to defend his wife's honor, and he was compelled to follow it. Instead of being labeled a known killer, he was seen as a hero to both women and family men alike. He actually gained popularity from the incident. The case was closed. After the trial was over, Menlo hoped to put the past behind Arna and himself by moving away from Indiana. He opened an office in New York where the entertainment industry was flourishing. He went on to become an early film distributor, and this only added to his professional resume, name recognition, and wealth. But by 1926, Menlo Moore found himself in very poor health. He and Arna then moved to Los Angeles, California. He thought the West Coast would be warmer and better for his health, but it wasn't. In October, convinced he was dying, Menlo took a long train ride back to his hometown of Mitchell, Indiana, to see his mother and father one last time. 
and without a doubt, passing by the little opera house that held so many memories. Just a few weeks later, on November 22, 1926, Menlo E. Moore, master showman, promoter, film distributor, and entertainment giant, died at his parents' home. He was only 45 years old. Still standing today as a private residence, the home is silent about the great man that once brought the world to Mitchell, Indiana. From the front steps, you can see the opera house and wonder if that's how Menlo spent his final days, looking out at the opera house and thinking about all he'd created in his short life. He was buried at Mitchell City Cemetery below a large family plot headstone. But he's the only one there. He lays below a small, simple stone with his name and two years, a beginning and an end. Ironically understating the bigger-than-life man he was and how he put the Mitchell Opera House on the world map. He'd made a name for himself in Chicago, Vincennes, Fort Wayne, Mitchell, New York, and Los Angeles. But in the end, he was reduced to only 10 letters on a piece of granite. The Opera House hosted talent through 1927, but when the nearby Orpheum Theater started showing movies with sound in 1928, it was the final blow to Mitchell's once great Opera House. The movies with sound simply captivated the town, and live entertainment was suddenly old-fashioned. With World War II requiring men and resources, to win the war, the Opera House sat empty and mostly unused. After the war, it became a place for young people to meet, listen to music played on a jukebox, and dance. There was a concession stand and no doubt lots of bad pickup lines. Some people met their future spouses at the old Opera House. From 1958 to the 1970s, it became a formal city hall, becoming a place to get a marriage license and pay your water bill. It also functioned as a hub for the police and fire department, but that too came to an end when a new city hall was built. It was like a dark cloud hovered over the opera house, and nothing on earth could keep it open. It was the 1980s. MTV brought music videos to cable TV, revolutionizing the music industry. Epic movies defined an era. Doug Hartzell, that grew up at Mitchell, Indiana, was at Indiana University studying theater. He wrote a college paper about the Mitchell Opera House. It impressed his professor so much that he encouraged Doug to save the once famous landmark. Just like Menlo Moore, Doug was a Mitchell, Indiana native, had a talent for promotion and organizing people. A not-for-profit called Opera House, Inc. was formed, and the Opera House was renovated. And just like Menlo, 
he was able to convince big city talent to come to Mitchell, Indiana's Opera House. He organized shows, created bookings, and the old Opera House was alive once again. Also like Menlo Moore, Doug moved to Chicago to manage another theater while sending world-class entertainment home to Mitchell. But very strangely, just like Menlo Moore, Doug Hartzell became ill and came home to Mitchell to be with his parents. He, too, passed away at his parents' place, July 19, 1997, for a little over 70 years after Menlo Moore died. Like Menlo, Doug Hartzell died young, at only 38 years old. And you might have guessed this, but he was also buried at the Mitchell City Cemetery, just like Menlo Moore. His parents Peggy and Bud kept his dream alive, operating the theater a little over 15 more years. Until Bud passed away in 2011, and Peggy in 2012. Peggy was so dedicated to her son's dream that she booked acts from her hospital bed. But with her passing, it appeared the dream was finally over. The Mitchell Opera House fell into significant disrepair. Bats were living in the ceiling and the place smelled of their droppings. The place was so bad that the growing sentiment was to just tear it down and put in a parking lot. But that didn't happen. The city of Mitchell entrusted David Miller of Hoosier Uplands to save this worthy building. On October 21st, 2014, the town of Mitchell deeded the property to Hoosier Uplands and work was started. In 256 days, the renovated and revitalized property reclaimed its place as the region's premier live entertainment venue on July 4th 2015. Because of a great passion and a lot of hard work, the Mitchell Opera House is still here, instead of just a memory of the past. And it's open for business once again. A new PA system rewards audiences with a pristine sound experience. Modern lighting sets the mood for any performance. While the legacy of the past adorn the walls. Not to mention, there's an impressively large screen, one that would have certainly rivaled the Orpheum Theater so long ago. At Christmas time, children are invited to watch the Polar Express in their pajamas as a community event.
and to think this amazing entertainment venue, this pillar of Lawrence County history, almost became a parking lot in 2014. You truly can tell a lot about a town by the things people choose to keep. The Mitchell Opera House is a treasure of Lawrence County's past, saved from extinction and preserved for future generations to come. Telling the world that history, community legacy, and great live entertainment still matter. <laughs>